Um, so I'm here with uh, Andy Quillen at uh, Berlin, uh, right before the, the second RevPro GWF show, actually, that's uh, going to take place uh, later tonight. So um, is this your first time in Germany? Um, it's not actually. Like many, many moons ago, I used to referee some shows for WXW. Um, we're going back. Uh, this would be one of the shows I was on was uh, the, the Chris Hero versus CM Punk Iron Man match. Oh, that, so that, that was a long sure. time ago. That was ago. a very long time ago. That's <laughs> aging me. But I was very young at the time. Um, but that was uh, around that time. Um, and then I had a brief hiatus where I had a real job and I, I ran a couple of conferences actually right here in Berlin. So um, this is, I've, I've been to Germany quite a few times, but this is probably my favorite time. It's the nicest weather I've experienced in Berlin. Oh, yeah, it was pretty warm and uh, really, really warm inside the arena last night. <laughs> yes, it was, yeah. Uh, af afternoon, actually, because uh, you, you ran before the uh, SmackDown tape. Yeah, which blows my mind that there was that many people there on a Tuesday afternoon. Um, I know, obviously, we, we had the help of having the WWE crew there that evening, so a lot of wrestling fans in town. Um, but two o'clock on a Friday afternoon, just absolute insanity. Like, uh, you know, to be... And it's nice to be done, you know, done nice and early so you can enjoy enjoy the evening. And I think that that's been great as well because often when you go to places, you don't get to look around. You, you just kind of get there, you do the show, you get out. So um, that's been one of the nice things as well. And a lot of wrestlers came in a day early as well um, and, and got to kind of experience uh, the sights of Berlin also. So I think it's been a very fun and, and rewarding trip all around. So you've probably seen more of Berlin than I've seen of London last weekend. <laughs> uh, probably, yeah. yeah. There's, there was something to do every second of the, that weekend, wasn't there? Is it, that was madness. Um, you know, I may have seen more of Berlin than I have London. Uh, <laughs> I don't actually live in London, but, um, but yeah, we do shows but in and out, in and out. So yeah, but I've definitely I've seen more of Berlin this weekend than I saw of London last weekend also. So your uh, Twitter bio says owner, promoter, booker, commentator, and check of all trades for uh, Revolution Pro Wrestling. So which one of those roles is your favorite? Uh, booker. That's it. That's it. If, I, if, I could just, uh, if I could just do one thing, it would just be booking professional wrestling shows. Um, but unfortunately, it, it, the way professional wrestling is, the way independent wrestling is, and if you're going to have a sustainable business and um, you know, build to the future, um, it necessitates you taking on a lot of roles. And that's where the jack of all trades uh, bit came in. Um, and I've always had the mentality, a lot of people, they, they look at reasons why things can't happen. And my philosophy is to work out how we can make it happen. And that's what we've been doing since day one, making it happen. If we can't do something, we learn how to do something. Um, and it's not always perfect, but the, the thing is, If it was to if it was to be perfect, if we could get outside organizations in to get stuff done and then it's very, very possible that we wouldn't be able to do this because we couldn't make it work financially. So, you know, it necessitates that and it necessi necessi necessitates that drive to make things happen. Um, but yeah, outside all the roles I do, um, yeah, booking's number one. That's what that's what I enjoy doing. I enjoy putting together matches, stories, I enjoy watching my vision come to life in front of a crowd. Um And if I could just do that, I'd be very happy. But unfortunately, we have to promote the shows. We have to make the video on demand. We have to pump out the match graphics. We have to do health and safety courses. We have to do paperwork. You know, we have to do so much, so many different aspects. But if I don't do it, no one else is going to do it. So I do that and my reward is getting to book shows. But unfortunately, I'm normally so exhausted by the time it gets to the shows that I don't get to enjoy as much as I would have liked. Like, I still haven't had a chance to reflect on uh, last weekend, really, because everything's just been go, go, go. Yeah, because I think that's something that uh, most people don't realize, how, how stressful and how busy it is to actually run a successful uh, independent promotion. Uh, we hear that in Germany uh, sometimes with uh, WXW, Tassili Jung often puts out stuff like, um, I think um, he, he wrote something like they have to like spend five figures a year just to properly get their taxes done and stuff like that. So you're actually running a real business here and you yeah. have to do anything that comes with it. That's what, that's what people don't realize and especially wrestling because wrestling is like the Wild West and we are one of a few companies who are legitimate in terms of we pay our taxes um, with VAT registered um, and that that gives you a disadvantage before uh, so it is crazy because if you're a if you're a startup wrestling company so if you promote your first show um, you're almost in an advantageous position than someone who like myself as and, and WXW who um, 
who have to pay back into the system and it's like I lose like people don't realize like every ticket which is sold the company loses 20% of every sale before we even get started and then you lose a further 20 something percent at the end of a year if that money's profit so it's just insane and I don't think people realize um, that side of things either and that's the most stressful side of things because no one who got into the world of professional wrestling wants to be involved in paperwork and maths and figures you know we're all just big kids who haven't grown up and, uh, that, and that's what we want to do but unfortunately we have to do that stuff um, and yeah I think uh, WXW have done a great job and uh, they're lucky they've got a good team of people um, they've got a lot of people working on different aspects. Um, I've, I think I've been unlucky in many ways that um, we just haven't ever been able to get that right mix of, you know, the, the team um, pulling in the same direction. And, you know, I've never, everyone seems to find these people who want to do stuff for free as well. It's insane, but I don't. Like, is it, there seems to be a, you know, like a great production companies who will come in and they'll work, for, they'll work for free. And not that I want everyone to work for free, but that makes it a little bit easier to be a little bit more sustainable. Um, but in a lot of times, that's a short-term fix. And you've seen companies, especially in the UK across the years, you've seen companies who have had great production, their DVD outlet, because it's obviously going back years, but you know their DVD output was fantastic. Um, and then all of a sudden that, that output stops. But the reason is because the person who's been doing it for free no longer wants to do it for free. So again, it's, it goes back to that um, sustainability, you know, and that's what we're all about. Um It's a great segue, actually. You're talking about being a kid because your profile Twitter picture is actually you playing with the, with the Hasbros, as we all did when we were younger. Um, so um, you talked about uh, refereeing early on in your career. So how did the, the little boy, uh, boy playing with the Hasbros uh, become one of the most successful promoters in the UK? Um, well, you said we all used to play with Hasbros, but a lot of people used to play with Jack's Pacifics and, uh, and what was it, Mattel's. Just, just shows how old we, we you're are. Just, you're just <laughs> aging us. It's the second time I've been aged in this interview. I don't know what's going on here as a setup. Uh, but uh, yeah, look, from, from birth, I've loved professional wrestling. Like it's not from, well, from the age of four. That was it. You know, um, I was, I've told this story many times before, so I'm sorry if people have heard this before, but I was four years old. Um, I was at my aunt's house. I had a twin sister. Or I have a twin sister. Um, and we have cousins, all of whom are girls. So we were, and we used to go to my aunt's house every Saturday. Like I had a poor family, like my, my, uh, mum and dad, um, we were kind of poor, I guess, in, in many, many ways. Um, and, but my aunt was kind of well off. Um, and she had Sky TV and Sky TV was a big luxury in those days. So we went back to like 1991 now. Um, and I was bored because all the girls, on the whole, we'd, we'd play like a, my aunt had like a swimming pool in her garden. That's how rich she was. You know, in the UK, that's very rare, uh, let alone in the 90s. Um, so we'd all play together, but I, but then it would come time when the girls wanted to play girl things and I'd be bored. So I guess I was kind of bored one day, kicking up a fuss. And my aunt actually used to tape wrestling for her next door neighbor. Uh, the, the boy that lived next door. Um, so she was like, oh, why don't you watch this? See if you like it. And honestly, from the second I saw it, I was just captivated. And I don't know what it was, but I always say it was like a combination of things. Um, you know, larger than life characters, just the bright colors, flashing lights, the, the big crowds, the, the roars of the crowd, um, just the over the topness of it all. Um, a simple story of good versus evil. And in those days, it was Superstars, which was on uh, UK TV. And it used to just be essentially a series of squash matches, stars versus enhancement talent. And as a result of that, you were able to clearly work out the, the, the defined characters very, very quickly. And you, the, the, the line between good and bad, it wasn't as blurred as it is today. You know, now there's many shades of grey, but like back then it was just good versus bad, very easy to understand. And something that for a four-year-old was so easy for me to grasp. And I always say that I kind of, wrestling grew up with me because as I became a teenager, that's where it entered the Attitude Era and things became a bit more grown up, a bit more risque. And that's where it may have lost my attention before, but obviously because wrestling evolved, I kind of moved on with it. And then obviously as I grew a little bit older, I discovered the world of independent professional wrestling. Um, I became a connoisseur of professional wrestling. You know, I used to tape trade, get tapes from Japan. Everyone's first tapes with a uh, Super J Cup. I was it 95 with uh, 
um well, chris benoit yes yep. benoit black tiger eddie guerrero uh so that was a, that was one of them and the other the other big one was that king of deathmatch tournament with uh terry funk and cactus jack yeah. they were the two they were the two kind of gateway drugs to the independent wrestling world um but then from that point i got like anthologies of a dynamite kid who who absolutely blew my mind um and then ventured into the you know the, the indies so it was like czw at the time was quite big and then of course ring of honor came and from day one ring of honor just blew my mind but um i guess realistically how i got into it was um i just wanted to be around wrestling um when I was little, um, I we I won a competition in, in WWF magazine to go and see wrestling um, at, I think it was the XL Exhibition Centre in London. And uh, we won this competition, two free tickets, um, and my family couldn't afford the transport to get me from where I lived in South End to London, which is like an hour train ride. Um, and that kind of broke my heart, and I was kind of devastated by that fact. Um, and I guess from that point, and I'd never seen a live wrestling show, and then all of a sudden, live wrestling started popping up in our local theatres and leisure sports halls. And it was British wrestling, obviously, but like it featured people like the first one I went to see had the Bushwhackers on. <laughs> so like, you know, and I, I kind of, there is more to this, but you know, I saw like Bushwhackers, Marty Gennetti, Honky Tonk Man, Greg Valentine, Jake the Snake, Jim the Anvil Knight. So all the people you all saw the people originally. I, I saw when originally, absolutely, yeah. right. And it was great to see them. Now, when I saw them, they were very, very far from their prime. Even though when you look back now, they were actually still very young men at the time, right? But like, um, when you look now, someone's prime is probably 40 to 45 because they've been there that long they know the tricks and you know and i think that that's you look at the people who've come through like your aj styles um your la knight damian priest those guys are hitting their prime in their 40s you know um but like back then i was like you get to 30 and you're done um and which is, is just kind of blows your mind but i guess the business has evolved in such a way now um but um yeah, the, the rings for these shows were, we used to term like rinky dink rings. So they were tiny. Um, the ropes looked like they were hanging off. You know, you see the old territory footage where the ropes are kind of just hanging loose. It was kind of like that. So no one could really hit the ropes. Some of the shows were, uh, the ring was on a stage. And every time they hit the ropes, the ring would edge closer and closer to the stage. And you just knew it was an accident waiting to happen. Like, fortunately, it never did happen. Um, but like, uh, th there were funny things like, uh, you know, like one of the wrestlers um, attacked another wrestler with a wooden coat hanger. Why a wooden coat hanger? Because he couldn't get his hands on anything else. They hadn't thought, they had no foresight to have been like, oh, we need to get some kind of weapon. It's like, look backstage, found a coat hanger, that'll do. And that's where we got that, that will do attitude of British wrestling. Um, now, I'm, I'm going all over the place, but there was, a, there was a series of shows, which were kind of a higher level, I think. In a, um, it's a place called South End Tennis and Leisure Centre. Um, and the first one I went to, I managed to convince like maybe 12 of my friends to come to. It was, it was a lot of friends. We were front row. We took up the entire front row. Um, and they came back the next time and that 12, maybe more, came down to four. And then they came back the next time and it came down to two, me and one of my friends. And then one of my friends pulled out on the day. I remember this day significantly because I thought I could no longer go to the show. Um, but then my dad stepped up and uh, he took me to the show. Um, and it was a really nice bonding experience with me and my father. Um, and one of the memories that I kind of still cherish to this day, um, that's one of the things I like about wrestling as well, the way that there's not many activities. When you're a child, I've got a young boy, uh, six years old. Um, he's obviously very, he's very attached to his mum. Obviously he loves me. I'm the best dad ever, but very attached to his mum. There's not many things that um, uh, young, young children or young boys can do with their parents or their father that, um, you know, I guess there's, I guess there's football, there's wrestling, right? And because you, you always see like, the, you know, the, the dads, they want to get their kids involved in football um, because it's something for them to do with their kids. So I love it when I see like dads taking their young kids to shows because it's just a nice bonding activity, you know? Um, so it's, it's very pure. And I think my reasons for getting into wrestling were very pure. One of the main ones was um, after watching those shows, there was a reason why the number of my friends that came to the shows declined. And that's because quite frankly, they weren't very good. Um, and this was a higher quality one than the ones I'd previously seen. Um, it was a nice night out, but the way I kind of describe it to people is it's like a firework display. So you have a firework display. How many times do you want to go and watch fireworks? You know, you go and watch fireworks once a year and you don't need to see them. There's no desire to see fireworks again, right? You're not like, oh, that was a great firework display. Let's go again next week, right? 
And that's exactly the opposite that we want to create with wrestling. We want to create a fan base. We want to create episodic nature and we want people to be involved. Um, so anyway, long story short, I found a promotion called FWA. Um, FWA was a, a promotion um, which was kind of before its time. Um, they had production. They had real characters. Um, they had storylines and they had regular fans who'd go to watch their shows and be invested in what was going on. Very small level stuff. When you look back now, I don't think it ages very well, but at the time it was um, uh, groundbreaking, very groundbreaking. Um, and I guess like in many ways, if you look back at early WXW, you know, it probably doesn't hold up very well. But at the time for the German wrestling scene, groundbreaking, because it was the first company to bring in independent stars, like the same as FWA. And anyway, they wound up, uh, they had like a training school based in Portsmouth, which is ironically is where I'm based now and where I've got a training school. Um, and they had a referee course and one of my friends who was a, he was a wannabe wrestler who'd injured himself um, and couldn't wrestle anymore because of the, the injury he'd sustained. But he thought maybe I could be a referee. Um, I used to go and watch shows with him and he invited me along to referee on shows, uh, to, to the referee course, sorry. Um, and at the end they picked a referee to, who was the best on the day to then invite them to referee one of their trainee shows. Um, and I was that guy. I refereed that trainee show and the rest is history. I just was just any show I could get to to referee, I'd be on um, and I'd get all around the country, all around Europe. Um, and from there, I went on to be the booker of IPW UK. Um, I mean, you often see referees move into office positions um, because often they're in that uh, uh, area of trust because uh, promoters can talk to the referee without know with knowing the referee doesn't have an ulterior motive and knowing that the referee isn't, um, you know, isn't going to try and push themselves to, you know, and that, it's, it's, they have no agenda, so to speak. So the the referees often, and, and my referees have always become people I talk to about stuff, you know, um, and I think that that kind of then led to me developing that trust. But also, where I was refereeing up and down the country, and I'd referee every match on the shows, um, I would learn about different styles of wrestling, different wrestlers that perhaps, because in those days, you never used to get such a mix of wrestling from all around the country, all around Europe. You used to just get like regional wrestling, essentially. So you'd have a car of people from one part of the UK, a car of people from another part of the UK. Um, but where I'd wrestle, where, where I'd referee all over the place, I'd see people that I otherwise wouldn't be exposed to. Um, and then I was thinking, well, this guy would gel well with this guy. This guy would gel well with that guy. Um, and then you start learning about the positioning on cards, you know, where where certain stuff works, where so certain stuff doesn't work, what tends to be a great style of match to open shows, the twists, the turns. So essentially, I didn't even realise it, but I was being educated for this role I'm in now. Um, and I believe I was able to use all those tools when I was booking IPW to, um, to create a, a product that people would get behind and it was a very much a, a product that people followed and you know it was the same cast of fans that would come in each month to the same venue to watch our stories unfold and that's uh, really the mentality that I've carried through with Rev Pro. So you, you've mentioned IPW UK you broke away from them pretty much uh, 12 years ago because we yep. just had a Bang 12th on. anniversary yeah. show, uh, last so weekend. August 26th 2002 yeah And um, I was at the uh, anniversary show this year and also last year. And um, yeah, I think this year I almost enjoyed it a little bit more, even though we had that great um, Osprey Shingo match last year in the main event with the Jericho run in and everything. But um, what I noticed when I watched it, of course, you had guys like Ishii and Zack Sabre in, but it was uh, mostly um, what I would consider a, a homegrown uh, set of talent that you used to, to headline, especially with uh, Oku and Luke Jacobs. So um, yeah. How how do how did you enjoy those two big shows and how would you compare them to each other? Uh, I think this shows was without this this year's show was without a doubt better than last year's show. Um, I think they were both home runs in terms of we achieved what we wanted to achieve. Um, but this year um, it was a mix of obviously I think the, the balance of the show was a lot better. I think the match quality was better this year as well um, in terms of up and down the cards um, with no uh, there was really no bad matches on the show and there's really no real low points on the show. Um, And I feel that, um, you know, look, when you say like the, in terms of like audience reaction and audience fatigue, when you say that Gabe Kidd versus Donovan Dijak probably had the least reaction on the show, then you know, it's a great show, you know, because that match ice in isolation, if you watch that back ma match back in isolation, it was a very, very good match. Right. Um, But on that night, look at everything that was surrounding it. It was crazy. And I think that, like you say, like this year's was more of a homegrown show. And I feel that that's why I definitely take more, uh, like so much pride in it. Again, different challenges. If last year was the first time running independently that arena um, and seeing if we could do it. 
And this year was going in with confidence in our roster. So my mentality was last year, the audience was introduced to your Michael Okus, your Luke Jacobs. Because look, we run consistently up and down the country, but we run on a, obviously a much smaller scale. Um, it doesn't take away from the importance of what we do. I always feel like when we run a show like that, I'm like, oh man, I wish we could do that every week. And I absolutely do. But then when we get to the 229 where we run monthly, where we're going tomorrow, and, and we're in front of 250, 300 fans, I'm still just as pumped and just as in invested in those shows. Um, and it's just a shame we can't showcase them on that larger scale all the time. Because I, I believe, like, honestly, I'm not sitting here as a promoter and, and trying to push our product. I believe in our roster. I think we've got the, the most depth that we've ever had. Um, I believe we've got the most talented roster in the world. Um, uh, certainly, if you're not saying ahead of, absolutely alongside AEW, WWE, New Japan. I genuinely believe that. And I think that, you know, what you have to remember is last week, at last week's show, um, you've got guys on the show who are having those fantastic matches and people are coming away from it raving about it. But a lot of that percentage of fans aren't invested in those guys yet. So, you know, AEW, WWE has the advantage of weekly TV where they can get everyone invested in their characters. And we were able to achieve that without that level of investment from, I'd probably say, 50% of the crowd. Because look at the numbers. You know, we had 4,000 people there, just under 4,000. That was 3,900 and something. So, you know, realistically speaking, 50% of that crowd aren't regular goers to Revolution Pro Wrestling shows. So I think that that's the biggest testament to their ability, the fact that you're able to take people who aren't invested in you and make you care so deeply. And that's why next time the level of investment will be even deeper in the wrestlers. Because like I say, people remember um, Luke Jacobs, people remember like Michael Oku. But I dare say people wouldn't remember JJ Gale because JJ was on the undercard last year against Kosei Fujita. And this year he was against Tomohiro Ishii. He's had a great deal of development over the course of a year. And I think if you watch the two matches side by side, you'll see the development in JJ Gale. But people walk away from this weekend show, not just knowing Jacobs, Oku, but also JJ Gale, who had a hell of a match against Tomohiro Ishii. You know, so um, it's just a huge accomplishment, I feel. And, um, and it, it, it makes me proud. And I feel that, honestly, one of my, the biggest things I want to do in wrestling is leave a legacy. Um, and I think that developing young talent has become a big part of that. And we've obviously had to change up our, our methods and our game plans um, based on a lot of, of things. Obviously, COVID didn't help. NXT UK didn't help. Um, you know, uh, even the, the, uh, the advent of AEW is, is, whilst in many aspects it has helped, it's also, um, I, I feel like it's hindered the, the independent scene in the United States because you're perhaps getting people signed um, to one of the two. Because now WWE are in a rush to sign people as well. Right, they're competing with one another to sign people. So, um, so almost now, um, there's a rush to sign people. So some people are getting contracts before they would do normally, which means they don't get a chance to develop. Um, there's not really that big, you know, it's not really a big independent, you know, like Ring of Honor, where you, we could, we were in a great position when Ring of Honor was running because Ring of Honor wouldn't let their guys work anywhere in the United States. Um, so on weekends when Ring of, Honor, Ring of Honor was off, they'd be looking around the rest of the world to get work. So we knew we could pretty much always get a top name talent because of that fact. Um, but now there's very few uh, independent talents who have got that name value. Um, and I think the level of our guys have risen so much that they've surpassed the majority of independent wrestling talent across the States. So even bringing people in, whilst it's a nice novel thing to do, you know, um, it's... Uh, it doesn't necessarily enhance the quality of the card. And that's obviously what we're all about. So it's about getting that balance and getting that mix. So um, going back to last weekend, you I think you changed all your titles. You've got a whole new crew of uh, champions now. So um, what's what's in your future? Because we've got the British Jacob coming up. Um, obviously in October, we've got uh, the new, uh, the next Royal Quest show. We've got Global Wars um, the day before. So what can people expect from RevPro throughout the, the end of the year? Just more of the same. Like I always say, um, when, when you look at shows like that, so I remember specifically last year, um, everyone was saying to me, is this a culmination of, um, of every, this feels like a culmination of everything you've, you've done with Revolution Pro Wrestling. And I didn't like that. I didn't like that terminology. I didn't like that mindset because I think culmination suggests the end. Um, and to me, I was like, you know, this is, this is just a beginning for us. This is a, a stepping stone. This is, uh, this is to show what we can achieve. This is to show you our potential. 
Um, and I look at this year's show very much the same. However, obviously, with that year's worth of development of our talent, it puts us, puts us in that stronger position. Um, and yeah, there was a, a new set of champions. Um, it almost happened by chance that there's a new set of champions. It wasn't so much like, oh, we're turning the page on a new set of champions. It was just kind of, it just felt like a, the natural time for a lot of this stuff to happen. Um, but yeah, from this point, like you say, we, we there's no slowing down. I mean, look, we're, we're in Berlin already, like with seven days removed and we're on to our second show of, of in Berlin. Um, but um, we obviously want to cultivate these partnerships with with, uh, with people like GWF. Um, you know, earlier in the year, we were in Barcelona. Um, obviously, I hope to go back there. Um, but yeah, and then as far as domestically, just to continue to try and deliver and continue to try and put those marquee shows on, like this year is Global Wars UK is returning, as you said. Um, and it's the first time there's been a Global Wars in many, many years. It's one of the most requested shows to come back. Um, and that's coming back. Um, it's going to see not just involvement from New Japan Pro Wrestling, but also our, our partners in CMLL, um, also some stardom involvement. Um, so it's almost like, you know, we've evolved our partnerships. So it's, it will be like a, a mini Forbidden Door almost. Yeah, I guess you could look at it like that, yeah. Um, so um, I'm, I'm excited um, to see what comes out of that. Um, of course, we continue our monthly shows in London. Um, we've got a trios tournament coming up in Coventry. Um, the first time we've ever done a trios tournament. Um, the British J Cup is always a special time. Um, of course, our women's division's on fire now as well. Um, so there's just so much, so many exciting things. Um, and I, so, so realistically, the answer is it's more of the same. That's what you can expect, more of the same. It's business as usual. Um, and of course, we're going to be looking ahead to, to next year's anniversary show in whatever form that may take. So um, we're uh, we're very much focused on, on continuing that growth and evolution, and we're we're hoping that um, you know if we make enough noise, um, people will hear it, people will see it, and uh, you know if if we can get some, you know, I, I know I posted after the show on my Twitter about you know we've got no sponsors, we've got no TV, we've got no outside investment, we've got nothing at all. It's just myself, handful of people working very very hard to make this thing happen, and I feel like we're reaching a stage where if we can continue to do this. We can make enough noise. Um, people are going to start to take notice, and and that's obviously uh, going to would help accelerate our our future plans. Um, but obviously, make no mistake, um, if that doesn't come along, if that doesn't come into fruition, if we don't get sponsorship, we don't get TV. And again, TV has to be a TV that pays. It can't be a, a vanity project. Um, and if we don't get that stuff, it's fine. Because as we've discussed, we're doing everything in a sustainable way and we're continuing to build. We're just continuing to build slowly and, you know, we continue to walk before we run. And that's essentially, uh, that's the game plan. That's the goal, you know, just to keep moving forward. Um, it doesn't matter what our competitors are doing. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter what our, our friends are doing. You know, um, the only people we compare ourselves to is ourselves yesterday. So if we can find ourselves in a better position today than we were yesterday, then we're succeeding and we're doing what we need to do. Um, <clears throat> so you've mentioned, um, yeah, Global Wars and uh, the various promotions you're working with. So you're working with uh, with New Japan, with CMLL. There's obviously some kind of uh, relationship with AW as well, as we saw. Um, so um, how did all of that come about? Did they come to you? Did you go to them? Did it um, develop then through the New Japan partnership? It's, yeah, it's all a, it's all a hard work and cultivating relationships. So the New Japan uh, partnership came about because uh, we were looking for a headline for, I had the idea to run York Hall, um, which again, you look at York Hall now and people don't consider that to be a big show. But like, again, harping back to our original part of the conversation where I was talking about FWA, FWA ran free shows at York Hall and the legacy of FWA still trades off those free shows at York Hall to this day. Oh, God knows how many shows I've run at York Hall, you know, maybe 30 plus you know, and it's just another day at the office for us now. But the first time we run your call, everyone's like, you can't do it. You're not going to be able to do it. It's a white elephant. It's just, it's just not possible. It's not going to work. Um, but you know, like I said at the start, can't and won't change those words to can and will, you know, we can do it. We needed something which would be recognizable a name. And I just felt the style that we were going at the time, it wasn't time to bring in an ex WWE wrestler who was going to go through the motions and use their greatest hits i was like you know let's get something special i wanted jushin liger um and at the time i was working with prince devitt fergal um finn balor 
Um, and he was our cruiserweight champion at the time. And obviously he came through the New Japan Dojo system. Um, he was a top guy for New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, and I reached out to him about the possibility of bringing Drishin Liger in for a show. Um, and it's kind of the rest is kind of history. You know, he was, we brought him in, we looked after him. There was New Japan had many, many um, failed attempts at relationships with the UK because people just let them down, you know. And I think we were the first solid partner that they had over here. And it was at a time when New Japan had just started. Access to New Japan shows were starting to grow, still in its infancy, but you could pay for the big New Japan shows and you could watch them instantly. You could watch them on demand. Um, you could pay, I think maybe a year or so later was when the G1 package came. So this is all before New Japan World was born, but like where people were able to watch stuff quickly, people were starting to catch on to the product. And I think that we helped do a good thing in introducing those characters. And we bought in, the next one we bought in was Tanahashi. And then we bought in Nakamura. And then we bought in Okada. So all their top guys, um, all with clearly defined characters, all with a superstar aura. And every time they came through, they were treated like stars. The fans responded to them like stars. Um, and it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. And and that's kind of how the New Japan brand grew within the United Kingdom. Um, so obviously, when you have a, and, and look, don't get me wrong, we were have always been the B side of a relationship in terms of, um, you know, we are a lot smaller, we can offer a lot less, but they recognize um, what we can bring to the table and they respect us, you know, and that's that's all we ask for. You know, a good, a successful partnership requires both sides to be able to bring something to the table and it requires respect from both sides. Um, and over the years, that respect has grown and evolved. And once you've got that respect of a, a company like New Japan, everyone knows about how, how um, New Japan Pro Wrestling are loyal to their partners. Everyone knows about how um, disrespect um, that, that, that New Japan demands and the respect that they give in return. And they know that they wouldn't hang around with a partner who doesn't uh, who doesn't tick those boxes, who doesn't have those qualities. Um, and as a result of that, that really gives us that bit of legitimacy. You know, it, it kind of gives us that validation. People know that they can trust us and people know they can work with us um, and they can do it safely in the knowledge that obviously we've now got a track record that we're building. Um, the CMLL relationship came about um, when Yota Suji was actually on excursion. So New Japan, the next development in our New Japan relationship was they started sending wrestlers for excursion with us. Um, and Yota Suji was one of the wrestlers who came just, uh, he would have been just post pandemic Yota Suji. Um, and as part of his excursion, so he made it very clear he wanted to go to Mexico for his excursion. Um, so when he was, but when, but when he, we were coming off of COVID, Mexico was a lot, uh, I don't know, I guess it was just a lot crazier than, than the UK. Like the UK kind of settled down before Mexico did and they'd made the decision to send Suji to, me, to the UK. Um, but as a part of that, he was able to go to Mexico for, I think, three months in the middle of his excursion before coming back to finish up here. And in that time, um, they were asking him questions about Rev Pro, etc. Um, and that's where essentially Suji opened that door for us. And Suji was like, hey, can you speak to Okamura? Uh, he books a foreign talent for CMOL. He's very interested in opening this relationship. Um, and it was one of those things whereby we couldn't do anything instantly because, again, we were suffering so bad from coming off of COVID. Um, but it was something where we were like, yes, let's explore this in the future. And then that time came last year. And CMOL have probably been the most inf enthusiastic partner that we've had, you know, um, and it's great. And we've seen what, what benefit that's had for like people like Michael Oku, Robbie X, who's just come back from CMOL. Um, oh, and let's not forget with the New Japan relationship as well, that opened the door for Will Ospreay. It was a match on one of our shows, a global wars, a very first global wars, actually, Will Ospreay versus Kazuchika Okada. And that was a match that opened the door for Will Ospreay to go to Japan. So, you know, so when you give uh, New Japan uh, something like that, a star like that, you open their eyes to that kind of star, then, you know, they, they should really uh, owe us for life, shouldn't they? Because think about the moments that uh, Will Ospreay's created for them. And uh, and then in turn, what he's creating for AEW just last weekend in Wembley. It was just insane seeing that happen live. Um, so, uh, so yeah, from there, it was like CMOL. Uh, we've, we've like dabbled with like Ring of Honor. There was never, with Ring of Honor before, there was never a risk. It was never a two site. It was, what can we do for them? It was never, you know, they'd drop our name here and there, but it was never a uh, two-sided relationship. Like there was a, um, it was run by a business guy, you know, um, from Sinclair, Greg, and he, he wasn't a wrestling guy. He wasn't interested. Like, you know, we got along with each other 
he was he was perfectly you know um a nice guy but th there was so many we could have explored so many avenues in our relationship that we never did um and i always think that was a bit of a shame um because i feel like we were definitely um a good fit for one another um and especially given the fact, like I say, that we were able to independently book a lot of Ring of Honor talent, why not make it official, you know? Um, so that was a shame. Um, but yeah, all partnerships come, like people come up to us and, and you know, want to collaborate with us. Um, like GWF approached us about this. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's it all stems from that New Japan relationship and the trust that New Japan have in us. And people see that from the outside and they see... When you see successful collaborations like we did in Barcelona, like you're seeing this weekend in Germany, um, you know, that makes people realize and say, hey, we could, you know, all benefit from working alongside each other. Um, and and that's what it is. That's what a successful partnership is. It's working alongside one another um, and, and playing off of each other's strengths because we've got strengths that our partners don't have and our partners have got strengths that we don't have. And together we we make each other stronger and we learn from them. Like I've learned so much about the business from New Japan. Um, I'm learning so much about CMOL and uh, and that style of wrestling. I've got so many exciting views. It's opened my eyes to another world of professional wrestling and the way we could contextualize that world of professional wrestling within uh, our style of professional wrestling, you know, um, and it's exciting. And that's what I enjoy. That's what I enjoy about these partnerships. And when you work with other people who have are like-minded who are as excited as you are about this stuff um it motivates you it drives you and uh, and that's only positive and of course our stuff with AEW is uh very much case by case you know they're a huge promotion but like uh and there's so many people working there you know um but um with AEW I just they have the the benefits of the industry at mind as well they're not so like WWE is very uh, again, I, it may have changed. It may have changed because you see WWE working with TNA, um, but you have to look at history. And you know, if you're if you're a wrestling historian, you'd be skeptical. You you, you couldn't be you couldn't be blamed for being skeptical about how that's going to wind up. But look, you you can only judge what's in front of you. And so far, it seems to be working. So maybe WWE are opening their minds to uh, to working alongside people and realizing that the benefit for the industry to benefit there has to be grassroots wrestling we're no threat to wwe you know we are essentially we're a different product to them but we are training people in their field that even when they're ready wwe could use as assets you know we're no threat at all you know um and i always think when there's events going on so for example with aew last weekend in wembley you had Q&A shows, you had wrestling shows, you had merch stalls, you had autograph signings. And it, tr it it's almost like that WrestleMania effect where it's like that celebration of professional wrestling. I've always felt WWE have felt a bit uh, like, oh, you're coming in and you're you're like taking mo money off of our out of our pockets by doing this. But no, they're creating a destination. And I think when you can create that destination, it's what it, it's, it's great for wrestling fans and it's great for the wrestling industry as a whole because it creates that sense of excitement. And I know so many wrestling fans who wouldn't go to WrestleMania if it was just a standalone WrestleMania with none of the stuff associated around it. They wouldn't go. But because there's all that stuff around it, that's where it becomes that destination. And I know WWE have done a good job in creating all the stuff, like, you know, their fan access and stuff like that. Um, but still, you know, variety is the spice of life. And to have all that different stuff and to, to be able to see these guys for the first time, you know, you see wrestlers have breakout weekends, and you know, that guy's going to be a future star. That's exciting. And for actual wrestling fans, that's exciting. Um, because... I don't know. I just know from when I was a fan, like I wish I had that kind of access when I was a fan. For me, it was just reading the magazines, you know, like we had a magazine in the UK called Power Slam. Um, and, you know, that was one of the first magazines to put real names in and stuff like that. And that's how I used to get all my knowledge, you know, but now these people get to see it firsthand, get to see all these upcoming guys firsthand. So um, I just think partnerships can be nothing but beneficial as long as everyone goes into it with that right mindset. So you've mentioned WWE and you've had a Cruiserweight Classic qualifying match at some point. And reportedly, um, that's just from what I heard, is um, because they had um, their relationships with Progress, with ICW, with WXW in Germany, uh, reportedly they approached you as well and you did not want to work with them. Is there anything to that uh, story? Um, I wouldn't say we didn't want to work with them. I think it was very much on the table for us to work with them. But, you know, there was, a, like I say, partnerships have to be two-sided. Um, so um, we never got to the stage of um, offers on the table to turn down. Uh, we had the conversations, um, but the offers, the, the, well, the, what was being put my way wasn't 
um, I don't, I'm trying to think of the right way to say it without getting myself in trouble. Um, <laughs> but you know, what was, basically what was being put to me wasn't something, you know, like, look, as a fan of WWE, of course I wanted to do it. Of course I wanted to be, look, one of the terms I used was, we'll bring you under the WWE umbrella. Of course I wanted to be under the WWE umbrella. Of course I wanted to wear my WWE merch and say, yeah, I work with WWE and get tickets to all the shows. And do you know what I mean? It's the biggest show on earth. It's a show that I've watched since childhood. And I, you know, I, I love it. I still like, I'm, I'm not going to say anything bad about WWE because WWE helps so many people, you know? And when I say helps so many people, I'm not talking about like the wrestlers, you know, it, obviously it's great for the wrestlers, but I'm talking about the fans, you know? Think how many lives that WWE has made, you know, I, and uh, including mine. If it wasn't for WWE, I wouldn't be doing this right now. So I'm never, neither, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm never going to say anything bad about WWE, you know? And of course I would have loved to have been involved, but they, you have to approach these things not as a fan. You can't, you know, I could have just had my blinkers on and just been like, okay, yep, yeah, whatever. We'd, yeah, whatever you want. Yep, yeah, we'll agree. We'll agree. Which I think some people did, you know, but I think ultimately it turned out okay for those that, that, kind of signed up to the uh, WWE thing but there were there were little caveats in there like they had they would have the option to buy the promotion it's a loan deal um a loan uh I forget how it was termed they'd like loan your footage for x amount of time to the network then at the end of the term of the contract they'd have the option to buy it's like option to buy the footage no the whole promotion so i think that's a bit of a leap you know, when you get to that stage and then you have to think what's going to happen to you. Like, are you going to get a job there? Is it going to be, can you get fired? Is there going to be a uh, no compete? Is that, do you know what I mean? So there's all these aspects of um, what next. And, you know, and, and for me, you could essentially, because of all the uncertainty, because in, in, in any, any difficult question was it's TBD, it's TBD. Any difficult question was asked. You know, what, what's going to happen to this? It's TBD. What's, what's your mindset on this? It's TBD. Um, you know, we need to explore that at the moment. You know, so there was no clear game plan, which is fine when you're in the early stages of conversation. But when you're talking about buying someone's business outright, you kind of need to have clear lines of thought, you know. Um, and of course, I had my partnership with New Japan. Didn't know. And that's why the initial, we had two sets of conversations. The initial set of conversation happened um, with William Regal. Um, which wasn't even a, it wasn't even the later set was with Triple H and then his team, but like, which was initiated by William Regal. But William Regal was a person who reached out originally. Um, and he's obviously like got a relationship with pro or had a relationship with progress, Jim Smallman, you know, they're friends, whatever. So um, he's always going to go in with the mindset of, you know, they're number one, we're number two, whatever. Um, but the, but again, the relation, the, the com we had the conversation, we agreed we we're open to doing stuff in the future. Um, but at the moment, it's very difficult because we've got our relationship with New Japan and my relationship with New Japan, like I, I'm loyal to them, you know, because it was, uh, they've, they've been loyal to me, therefore I'm loyal to them. So I'm not the type of person that's going to be like, sorry, New Japan, see you later. I'm the type of person that says, I'm interested, but I need to have a discussion with New Japan. This is going to be a lot more complicated than other deals that perhaps you're trying to put together, right? And that's where the initial set of conversations stopped. And then a while later, um, so this, so, uh, and then they did the, the championship tournament. I didn't really realize the championship, the conversations had stopped until they did the championship tournament and everyone's there suited and booted at the show. And I'm sat watching it in my pants in my living room. Um, but um but then we had another set of conversations a, a, a little bit later. I can't, obviously at this stage, I can't even remember the time scale. You know, we had another set of conversations a little bit later and that's what involved Triple H's team. Um, and that's where all the non-answers came into play. Um, so nothing happened, you know, and it's, uh, could something happen in the future? Maybe, you know, like I say, like it's, it's one of those things. Like I'm open to, I'm open to working with anyone, you know, and I feel like I'm, I'm, I've reached this stage in my professional wrestling career where I've put in a lot of time. I've put in a lot of hours. Um, I've dedicated my whole life to this. And because I've dedicated my whole life to this, of course, I'm not going to walk away from it, but I feel like we need to be taking those steps. You know, we need to be moving forward and the, obviously forging these relationships with New Japan, CMOL, AEW, et cetera. And the AEW relationship is not an official relationship. I, you know, I, I respect Tony a lot. I like Tony a lot. Um, I'd say I consider Tony a friend, you know, um, very friendly every time I see him. Um, uh, but obviously he's so busy, you know, it's not like I call him up for hour long chats and, you know, I'm sure we, we can have great chats because, uh, you know, um, Tony's uh, obviously runs Fulham and uh, Fulham have obviously just signed my ML Smith Rowe from Arsenal and uh, just took Reese Nelson from Arsenal on loan. So I'm sure we can have a lot of football conversation as well, um, as well as professional wrestling. When we get to American football, 
football, though. I'm done. Uh, no idea. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, so it's not really an official relationship with AEW, but it's like kind of we work alongside of each, alongside each other and we're respectful of one another. And I, Tony knows and his team know that if they need anything, all they've got to do is ask. Um, and occasionally I might ask for a favour from them and hope that they uh, realise that I'm more than happy to do as many favours for them as they like. So, uh, so yeah, it's nothing official, but, you know, we work alongside each other nicely and uh, and that's all you can ask for. And, uh, and who knows what the future holds for, for any of this, apart from the fact that I remain uh, determined to keep pushing this thing forward, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I, I've kind of reached that stage now where I've, I've put in so much to this and we it's, it's time to take this to the next level so how we go about doing is it partnerships that we go about doing this is it tv deals is it sponsorship you know um open for all exploration but it's it's we've got that what i've always wanted was that sustainable structure what i've always wanted is to to know that we're going to be okay from month to month right we started to get there just before the pandemic it's taken us all this time to rebuild this is the first year since the pandemic where we're actually in a stable situation which we would be on any other year but we had to pay a lot of pandemic debt back um so last year was a good year but it got us back to be able to float after coming back from that pandemic so yeah we're in a good position so um, i'll have to let you go because you actually have to go to the venue for the uh yeah for today's show um any final words to the to the wrestling fans around the world and also um yeah plug whatever you like where can people find you where can people find ref pro um ref pro on demand obviously you stream most of your shows live now so that's a really great product i enjoyed very much um i just want to say thank you really um because it's crazy that we're, look we're sat in berlin you're a, a european podcast and to get a reach outside even your home city you blow my mind you know um and to have fans around the world recognizing what Revolution Pro Wrestling is all about is for me a big achievement and for me something that I'm so proud of and so thankful for. Um, and I'm, f you know, there's one thing I hate more than anything that's people who disrespect fans. I hate terms like, oh, he's a mark or he's a smark. Hate it because they're the people that pay our wages. They're the people that make our product. And anyone who looks down on fans, uh, you know, they're not good people because ultimately, why are you in the wrestling business to begin with? You're in the wrestling business to begin with because you're a fan. Going back to that picture on my Twitter, that's why that's there. Yes, there's times when wrestling is a thankless business. Yes, there's times when um, you're like, you'd rather be anywhere else, right? And, and you're like, why did I do this? You know, and everyone says to me, if you, if you put as much time and effort into any other thing in the world, you'd be a millionaire. I don't know. I wouldn't be a millionaire because I wouldn't have the same passion. I wouldn't have the same drive. I wouldn't have the same determination. I wouldn't put the same amount of effort in full stop. Right. So whilst I appreciate that sentiment, it's not true. Right. I can only put this effort into wrestling because I love it so deeply. Right. And when there's times which are bad, when you have a bad show, you have a bad attendance, something doesn't go down the way you would have wanted. Something suddenly costs you loads of money. You get an unexpected tax bill, whatever it may be. Um, I always look back to that picture on my Twitter And I can say, what would that child be thinking now? You know, I must be like, what, six, seven, eight years old when that, maybe eight years old when that picture was taken. And if the eight-year-old me knew that I'd be doing what I'm doing now, it would blow his mind, right? So first and foremost, I'm a wrestling fan. And that's why I respect each and every single wrestling fan. That's why I'll always make time for wrestling fans, no matter what. Um, and I recognize we're doing this one fan at a time. So if 10 people listen to the podcast and nine people who know who I am, And one person doesn't. And as a result of that, that one person subscribes to our on-demand service, buys a ticket to one of our shows, buys a t-shirt, whatever it may be, then it's worthwhile doing because we've created a new fan. And then hopefully that fan will then go and tell their friends about it, you know, and we, we do it. We build it brick by brick, brick by brick, one fan at a time, you know. Um, and so I just want to say, like I say, thank you. And I respect you and I appreciate everything the passion i appreciate it all because that's me and that's where i would have been when i was you know when i was a teenager before i got into um the business that that is me and i just hope that we're creating a product that you can be a lot more proud of than the product that i used to watch when i was younger you know um so thank you um and If you want to support us, then the best ways to do it, revproondemand.com is our streaming service. We stream most of our shows live, um, but you've got the full archive up there. Um, revolutionprowrestling.com is our website. From the website, you can get to the shop where we stock official RevPro, CMOL, and New Japan merchandise. Um, and you can get 
on to our to get all the tickets to all our upcoming shows and events um so yeah and and most of all just if you enjoy what you see please spread the word that's it because that's the only way we can do it okay great thank you very much and thanks for your time no problem anytime thank you very much